to uh, so every uh, year or so, um, there's like a group of about five of chicken and people, <laughs> and we, we try to get together and talk about chicken and But at the same time, we usually try to organize a conference so that we can invite all kinds of people that we find interesting um, to give talks and have discussions so that we can learn what? And then Enrique. And and so, um, welcome to uh, this conference. So, I'm really excited about this. Um, uh, we've got like, some really interesting talks lined up, at least I think so. I'm going to move past people. Um, and, uh, well, there isn't that much to say. I let me think of administrative things. There are programs here if you want uh, to get more programs. Um, there's coffee out in the other room. Um, the door, if you leave, uh, the, the door, um, if it ever closes, you need a key card to get back in. So if for some reason somebody takes that wedge out of the door, um, please um, just find some student or whoever has a key card by the end of the door or something. Um, but we'll try to keep that door wedged open for the same time. Um, also, we're trying to record the talks. So uh, during the question period, if you want to ask a question, uh, we'll try to bring the mic out. Hopefully this will work. That way we'll be able to pick up some of the questions. Um, okay. So please try to do that to how long that lasts. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Any questions about uh, anything? No? Okay. So let me uh, introduce our first speaker. Since this is a kind of shape dynamics meeting, it's good to open the conference with um, Julian Barber, who's basically its intuitions were basically the driving force for this field since the very beginning. Um, and so he's going to tell us a little bit about where those intuitions, what they are and where they're going now. Thank you. Um, a bit of an introduction. Uh, basically, my talk is, is uh, the talk I'm going to be giving in, in a few days in, uh, in Cork, in Ireland. Um, it's for the 75th birthday of Nila Murahu. Uh, and it's really a great, um, it's a great get together of the remaining members of, of the Pinston group around uh, John Wheeler. So somebody called Dan Kenefick uh, organized this thing. They're all coming at their own expense. Uh, Kip Thorne will be there, Bill Unruh, uh, Robert Wald, and a great number of sort of substantial middle-ranking uh, relativists. They're all coming to celebrate uh, uh 75th birthday in Cork, um, and I'll be one of the speakers there. So basically, my, my talk, uh, and because I've got 30 minutes, and uh, I want to leave five minutes for, uh, in Cork, and five minutes for questions, I am actually going to read my talk in Cork, but I'm not going to do it here uh, to try and make sure I, I keep to time. But basically, my slides are the Cork talk, at least at the and then depending on the questions you throw in, and please throw in questions at any stage, um, we'll just see how far I get, and I don't think it matters how far I do get because there'll be enough is um, So, um, I've actually been independent pretty well all my time. And nest under the tiles, they've just come back from Southern Africa. Um, shops there. Two thousand and one. Here's Nilo Murahu here. Here's Brendan Foster who works for um, FQXI and did uh, the first big paper with Neil and me on relativity without el relativity. That's Edward Anderson. Uh, that's two of my daughters, Dorcas and Naomi, my late wife Farena, and for very much a down-to-earth person, and the, the, during our conference dinner, workshop dinner, she, she suddenly asked very skeptically, what's all this talking about? What are you looking for? So Neil said one word, fame. <laughs> Edward Anderson said, the truth. I said, well, if it works out, I'll have a topic for another popular science book and might make some useful money. And then Brendan said, <laughs> Brendan said I just like visiting the Barber family. <laughs> And Brendan's going to be there uh, at, uh, in Cork. Um, so, um, it's a bit surprising with Machian ideas. So, Neil was extremely skeptical about Mach's principle as being vague. And 
maybe the fact that our nation flourished for about 10 years did lead to something I think quite substantial, this, this book that came out a few months ago. Uh, maybe it's a case of, of opposites being able to uh, spar fruitfully and, and something worthwhile come out of it. Um, the, the motto of the book is Kepler's reaction to the Tycho Brahe's discovery observations of a comet which Kepler was convinced showed that the planets could not be carried by crystal spheres. And this led him to make this, this wonderful comment, henceforth the planets must find their way through the void like the birds through the air. We must philosophize about these things differently. And that was actually, that realization of Kepler was incredibly important. It led him to discover the laws of planetary motion without the complete change in thinking, basically that there are no crystal spheres or no crutches. And I would say, I suspect that one of the problems, if we're right with shape dynamics, I think the problem is that one still thinks that there is a sort of a scale and a time flowing independently of what is happening within the universe, that rods and clocks are sort of external crutches with which you describe what's actually happening in the universe. And I think that that may be actually fundamentally wrong. And in fact, I always say that Kepler's remark there and what he did was the first great implementation of Marx's principle 300 years before uh, Einstein coined the expression. It's all about relationalism, that physics must be about relationalism, which means that any physical quantity has got to be a dimensionless ratio. And, and that, I think, has surprising uh, implications when you take it further. So let me get straight down to business. Um, so uh, the talk I'm going to give is whether there are two different ways in which you can approach general relativity. And I think the, the, first way to, the first thing to be clear about is that there's two totally different meanings of relativity. There is Einstein's meaning of relativity, which is relativity of simultaneity at spatially separated points, and it's expressed in the fact that you can slice space-time in any way you'd like. It doesn't even have to be straight lines. It can be uh, any space a notion of And that is completely different, really, from Marx's idea, which is that, that he assumed, he didn't question absolute simultaneity, that came later, but he assumed that the position of any particle here only has meaning relative to every other particle. Every we follow up this idea of Marx, I argue, and this is what really came out of uh, the interaction with Neil, which then many people joined in, as you saw, that there are two ways of arriving at general relativity, and perhaps it may be that the Machian one is more fundamental, and that the Einstein one is, is less fundamental. Then the, the, the two relativities are there, they're compatible, they're mutually compatible, but maybe the more fundamental one is the, is the Machian one. Um, and, and you have these two famous sayings of Marx, the universe is given once only with its relative motions alone determinable, and it's utterly impossible to measure the changes of things by time. Quite the contrary, time is an abstraction at which we arrive by means of the changes of things. And that calls for a different kinematic framework for describing the universe, uh, just, shall we say, already for an island universe defined by the n-body problem, the Newtonian n-body problem. The reason of describing this thing should not be absolute space. That's, that's essentially the residue crystal sphere trivial position which is not significant and it's not corrupt in relativity of absolute orientation and also a notion of absolute size and a notion of duration. And all of these are external crutches which are holding up the universe as it does its things. And actually the universe swims in nothing. So you must get rid of those crutches and you do that by passing from the Newtonian. You eliminate all the absolutes from Newtonian n-body kinematics. By first, you start with the Newtonian configuration space into which the ideas of 
relative separations of objects in Euclidean space. Nothing else goes into the proceedings. And then you quotient by rotations, and then you get the relative configuration space, uh, which, uh, but it's still got scale in it. So then you take one more uh, quotienting, and you get to shape space. Now, uh, the three-body problem, everything we want to describe it can be explained by the, the Newtonian three-body problem. Uh, and it really makes you think about things in a completely different way. And the great thing about the three-body problem is a triangle, the, the three particles are uh, a triangle, one uh, degree of freedom describes its size, and two describes its shape. And if that three-body problem is your toy model of the whole universe, that must be just the shape is all that counts. It's just the shape. Yep? Just to, to, to put this into context, when you say the whole universe, you mean particles interacting by gravitation alone? In, in this case, but it, will, it, 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 can ex it can extend to other interactions as well. But, it, but it already to cast... To do the equivalent of Kepler recognizing there are no crystal spheres, this is already enough, I hope, to sow doubt. Okay? I think it makes you think it's enough to do that. So, shape space has... Uh, you. So, uh, the other thing that goes in is the Newtonian concept of, of, of mass. So, you... Uh, but in, if you go to dynamical geometry, there isn't, you, can, you can do without a concept of mass. But at least for the n-body problem, all that is going to go in is, is, is geometrical relationships, ratios of distances, and, and masses. And this representation here is how you can represent the three-body problem when you only describe the shape. Uh, when, when you only think of... Allowing distortion and twisting. Uh, And the two so if I have a triangle, I mean the the, the classic. There are no. I have a triangle and I hold it up at right angles to me and move it backwards and forwards. Ah, oh, well that's well that's cha that's going to change the shape. As you're defining it. Yes, that changes the. Sh I regard that as a change of shape. Yeah, yes, yes, thank you, yes. So, uh, this thing, this representation here is for uh, equal masses of the particles and the distances that go in are mass weighted. So, essentially, you take the square root of the, it's using square roots of masses and, 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 and relative distances. So, what this is, every point on the shape sphere represents the shape of a triangle. Uh, Points with equal longitude and opposite latitude are mirror images of each other. The equilateral tri in the case of equal masses, the equilateral triangles are at the poles. And you have collinear configurations on the equator. These are what are called Euler configurations, which I'll come to in a moment. But they are at extrema of this uh, color coding here, which I'll explain in the next slide. And then there are three two-body coincidences. Those are the points where two particles become uh, the distance between two of the particles uh, divided by the distance to the third becomes zero, tends to the zero in the limit. So that's what you have there. So there are six distinguished points on the equator. And, and then you go from there, you pass from one congruence class to another. You have a change of, of orientation. So that's, that's our kinematics of, of, of the situation. Oops. I don't know why this suddenly shoots forward so much. Yeah? Yes.
It's, it's, epi it's epistemic. I would say that I think it's quite. I think it's very dangerous to say the universe is expanding. I was on a radio program with Martin Rees, and I said the expanding universe stinks. <laughs> and Martin said, "Oh, Julian, your philosophy may be all right, but I think you're forgetting 95% of so the physics." So how? I mean, so then how do you interpret Hubble's law? That the. I, what is definitely without question is that the typical, you divide the typical galactic diameter by the typical intergalactic separation. And as the universe is getting older, that ratio is getting smaller. That is the objective epistemological fact. Which means that this is a semantic kind of thing. Instead of calling it expansion, you call it the way you just described. But we're talking from the same thing. Well, no, it, it, well, well it, it won't because, because of the, the, the Hawking-Penrose theorems, they thought that there was an unexpected, uh, uh, unacceptable singularity at the Big Bang, and that's because the scale factor goes to zero. Now, what has recently been shown is that if you actually only look how the shape is changing, it goes through the Big Bang perfectly happily. There is no singularity of the shape evolution. Sean, you wanted to say something. I just wanted to actually, Dave's going to talk a lot about the specific point and what the consequences are in his talk. So, it's like a very important question, but I think it might be better to let Dave make it. But that last thing is too provocative. So, for instance, how do you explain nuclear synthesis in the early universe and the emission of the cosmic microwave background radiation? All of this can be translated into uh, relational terms. I mean, all. their measured quantity by the... Yeah, I mean, all objective statements in physics are about dimensionless ratios. There are no objective statements were not about dimensionless ratios. All I'm saying is just apply that consistently in cosmology. And people are actually just forgetting that. Yes, but the, 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 the objective thing is the ratio of the, hydro, of, the, of the ball radius to the radius of the nucleus, a flea in a, in a cathedral. That's the objective statement about, uh, about uh, particle physics. Those are objective statements. shape sphere uh, because you, you're, you're dividing zero by zero and it's meaningless. No, no, there isn't really a problem but you have to do the mathematics a bit carefully and, and, and two body collisions are not a problem in the end body problem. Three body collisions, total collisions are an issue but we, we've persuaded the end body specialists now that they're not a problem if you just look at how the shape changes. In fact the way the shape changes gets simpler at the analog of the it, it becomes geodesic on the shape sphere instead of being a breakdown of physics. Actually, in this three-body problem, <coughs> you, can also, you can only reach the total collision in one of those parts. Either here or here at the Euler configuration. Yes, where, where you have exactly no forces. Mm. Yeah, they're isolated, but I mean, they're still singular. They're singular because of Newton's absolute scale. Once you take out the absolute scale and take away the uh, everything is fine. 
It just goes through the triple collision without batting an eyelid. On shape, on the just curve will just go through. It'll come in and it'll go out the other side. And, and it becomes it becomes geodesic here. It's not geodesic out there, but it's geodesic at the at what everybody thinks is the catastrophe. You know, you, you put the line there, but it's difficult to go to the next line. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go on. let's go on to the next one. <laughs> right now, I want to introduce the two key quantities that in Newtonian theory do depend upon a scale. One is the root mean square length, which I think you can probably, you take the sum of the squares of all the interparticle separations, multiply by the, ma the pairs of the masses, divide by the total mass, take the square root, that's a length, that's a quantity of length, and it is identically equal to, uh, up to a factor of the total m mass, to the center of mass moment of inertia, these are center of uh, positions relative to the center of mass. That's what I call this, that's what the end body people call the center of mass moment of inertia. That's the, that's the, so that's, that's the root mean square length. And then there's another quantity which is called the mean harmonic length, which is the inverse of the Newton potential, basically. And these are two lengths which are, I mean, in many ways you uh, define quantities with dimensions of length, but these are the two simplest and they're given, just because they are rather significant, they're given names the root mean square length and the mean harmonic length, and if you take their ratio you get a scale invariant quantity so everything should be in terms of this scale invariant quantity that's, that's meaningful and so, so uh, that's what the colour coding is the, the absolute minimum of, of, the, of this quantity which we call the complexity, which is which is essentially minus the normalized, the n body people talk about either the shape potential or the normalized Newton potential, uh, where they, uh, they make it a scale invariant quantity. I take the ratio of the two lengths. Tell you what the product. I've got the product, the, it, the mean harmonic length is the inverse of the Newton potential. So I'm taking, the, I'm taking the ratio of the two lengths, which means I'm multiplying the mean harmonic length into the Newton potential. And that gives me a scale invariant quantity, which the n-body people call, uh, we've coined the expression complexity. The n-body people call it either the shape potential with the, with the, uh, with the minus sign, or, or the normalized Newton potential. And actually, Two in Paris, in the observatory in Paris, and Richard Montgomery in Cruz. The, the two in Paris said, ah, we like Monsieur Jordan. That unfolds is determined by the shape potential, which is the, the negative of that. It's a function on the sphere. It's a function on the way what determines that's objects towards the common sense of mass which are unobservable within the universe but in the thing can see the, the forces generated by the shape potential so this is this is getting down to the essence We don't, um, it, it will, t we don't, uh, we get away with pre, we don't have any pre-assigned metric of time. We derive one from the way things change. So uh, that, that will come. So all we have is a chronological ordering. We assume that one shape, that, I mean, for, what was it, Ford or somebody said, history is one damn thing after another. Shape dynamics is one shape after another in a continuous curve. Uh, yes, it, it, it will. It will actually. It shows. Actually, by the way, it smooths it all out because actually, in the Newtonian picture, uh, this is a typical solution. By the way, when this is when the this is a, when the the scale in the Newtonian picture is that it's smallest and the three body interactions are non-trivial, and you see the shape is changing very rapidly. It looks as if the cha the shape is, is, is but it's actually spread out in in the Newtonian picture. All 
happens in the normal way in an extremely short period and that's why they, the Newtonian representation has difficulties. But in this picture when you represent it on the shape sphere it all looks beautifully smooth. You've, you've gone to a different represent, you've got a different parametrization of time here. No, it's in it. It's in it. It's in there, Michael. In this form, is that if you slightly change the direction here, then the, it will finish up with a different two. It will the, the pairs will finish up. That's the unpredictability. But that's where it goes. So uh, this is the how you get. Uh, you implement Mach's ideas by the idea of best matching, which, which Bertotti and I developed uh, 34, 35 years ago. Uh, basically, you just you want to define a dynamical evolution which makes no reference to any absolutes that Newton brought into physics. So you start off by supposing that there is. So you have two uh, triangles in this case that are slightly different in shape, it's shown rather big, but, but that, that sort of thing, and you, you just imagine that you've, you hold them anywhere in space, you imagine somewhere in space, and then there will, there are, the masses are the same in, in each thing, but the shape and the size is different, so you've got, it looks as if this particle has moved that one, that's moved that amount, and that one's moved that amount, so then you you make a trial distance or difference between the two configurations. This is just the new uh, kinetic metric. And you use Euclidean and translations and rotations to bring this one as close to exact congruence with that one as you can. But because they're slightly different, you can't do it. But there's a unique minimum. And that gives you a metric on the relative configuration space just by doing that. And it's actually just using the theory of Lie groups and the generators of, of, of uh, uh, the Lie algebra. That's, that's how you do it, you move it that way there. And you can go one step further uh, and actually include Dillon. That quantity that we had before, this is minus Sorry, so this, this, is, this is length to the minus two, and that's length to the plus two, so this is a scale invariant quantity. You do that, and then you get a metric on shape space. So you've got uh, Newtonian theory is, is described by the minimization of that, uh, but it's not a geodesic on shape space because of the role of scale if you want a geodesic theory on shape space. So you have kinds of theories. You have the theory which is a geodesic theory on the relative configuration space and you have one on the shape space and they, there's just one degree of freedom in there and you can't recover the Newtonian theory exactly here because this thing keeps the size, the, the root mean square length or the moment of inertia constant. The theory on shape space does not allow, in the Newtonian picture, you have a constant size of the universe. Uh, Whereas in the Newtonian theory, the, the, the size will change, and that shows up in, in the way the curves vary on space. So if we, if we go back here, this is a, a typical Newtonian solution, but the ge there are geodesics on shape space which will be, have the same point and direction at some point, but the Newtonian solutions will always just curve away from it. So this is the architectonic difference between the two theories. I did for a long time, and Sean, Sean and I argued about this a lot. We said, oh, it must be a geodesic theory, and then finally I was persuaded, no, it can't be the geodesic theory, it must be the one that falls just one short of that apparent Machian ideal. But that falling one short has very far-reaching consequences, which are very interesting. So, uh, I just want to show then how Newtonian, how you solve the problem of where uh, uh, inertial frames of reference comes from. So, you have that theory on the relative configuration space, the, the one, the Newtonian one, and you say you 
configuration and you imagine putting it anywhere in space, like my hand is, then you take the next one and you put it into the best match position relative to it, and Bertotti and I call that horizontal stacking, and you go on like that all the way through. So you've stacked one on top of each other uh, like a pack of cards. And then you can meaningfully say, this point here is at the same position as that point there and that point there. And that was the reason Newton didn't believe that you could do that in a relational theory. He introduced absolute space precisely so that he had a notion of equiposition, that you could talk about the same position at, at different points. Uh, that's in an unpublished paper of Newton's, but it, it's... At different, it, times. at different times, yes. That's, that's the key reason why Newton was driven to introduce absolute space. But if you have a finite number of particles, there. So that things. It's not in the it's not in the no, it's in an unpublished, long unpublished paper called De Gravitazione, which is very, very interesting. A lot of the confusion about this debate came because Newton suppressed it. De Gravitazione is a full frontal onslaught on, on Descartes, whom he calls a, a blooming idiot and so forth in this paper. Uh, uh, but by the time, a few years later, when he got around to uh, publishing the Principia, it was beneath his dignity to mention that Frenchman. And actually, the scolium to the Principia is very confusing because of that. <coughs> People, a, a, a huge amount of the confusion about absolute and relative motion comes because that paper, De Gravitazione, was only published uh, in about 1960. It's very illuminating, that paper. Um, and... Uh, Yes, I mean, beneath his dignity to mention the French, even though his theory of the colours of the rainbow was a small development of the brilliant and perfect analysis by Descartes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, no, well, I mean, you know what scientists are like. <laughs> we would, uh, so, um, so anyway, you, you, you get that. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, we Ten minutes? Yeah. yeah, it's fine. Well, as I said, I don't think it matters where, where I stop, because if, any <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's interested, I mean, I do recommend Flavio's book. I mean, if anybody wants to take this seriously with the mathematics laid out pretty nicely, it's in Flavio's book. And you don't even have to buy it. It's all online if you just go to Flavio. <laughs> if you put me... <laughs> Sorry, that's cost him about 30 quid. I mean, all of these diagrams are Flavio's that, that I show. He's, he's that. Uh, but sadly, he can't be here because his, uh, his, there's a crisis with his father's health, so that's why Flavio is not here today. Um, let's go on to the next one. Whoops. I, I don't know why this thing always goes on so fast. I just mentioned this thing here. That, that I think you could argue for a counterfactual history. If you... How many people here have read Riemann's 1854 paper where he introduced uh, uh, non-Euclidean geometry? Three there, yes, Tim has. Well, there's a, I think there's, there's a very interesting thing there. This paper. I've measured the interval. A few pages later, is of space that any measured by any by that is that without putting my hands together, I can say they have the same length, and that is just as suspect if you think about it as the question of whether simultaneously spatially separated points has any meaning which was first questioned in 1884 by Lord Kelvin's elder brother, James. Uh, so in geometry, the residual rigidity dimensional because he was absolutely if you Uh, 
country that we have to deal with. But I think if you go right back to Riemann and say, suppose Riemann and, and Cliff who proposed that geometry could be dynamical and had set about simultaneity at separated points and say the only thing that counts is equality of angles because 60 degrees here is dead. angles don't on a scale starting point then I think you actually can lead to uh, you get a completely different way of arriving at general relativity um, there is some there's one key property uh, which I won't go uh, well, it might come up in the next slide. But all of that, uh, very interesting, the first really big paper that Neil and Brendan Foster and I did, the one that's called Relativity Without Relativity, and Neil says he still thinks there's something almost magical about the paper. You first of all get a dynamical theory of geometry, which is vacuum general relativity. Then you try and couple a scalar field to it, and you find that there's a universal principle which enforces the universal light cone. And that comes about because the tensor field is more than the lead derivative of a scalar field or a one form. And this is what enforces, in, Leah, in Edward Anderson's words, the geometry bullies the other fields to have a universal light cone. And it goes further. So you get a universal mechanism, a, a, a universal notion of, of the light cone. But moreover, when you try to couple a one form, you find you get you actually four consistency conditions. Three, and the fourth one imposes the Gauss constraint. You get a first principles derivation of the gauge principle. And that's why Neil talks about that paper as, as almost magical. And I think it's very striking. And, and general relativity could have been found in a completely different way, which made, had no initial reliance whatsoever on relativity of simultaneity. And this is what simultaneity. Simultaneity are compatible, uh, but but they it may be that the mind is fundamental, and and so this idea of best matching can be taken further where you have geometry, so you have one three-dimensional conformal geometry here and another one that's slightly different, and now when re three-dimensional geometry automatically two infinite dimensional Lie groups came into existence. One is the three-dimensional diffeomorphism group and the other is the three-dimensional conformal group. And you use those to best match because they're there. So all of the tools of doing that best matching is there. And basically that's what, when you do the of the part exactly how we come to vacuum general relativity get the universal light cone and the gauge impressive and work to really uh, there is some more work that needs to be doing but this is this is a paper by Edward Anderson myself Brendan Foster Brian Keller who was Neil's student and myself from 2005 that there, is a, there is a defect in that paper as it stands, and one of the things that we ought to do is, 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 is uh, the shape dynamics can really sort that out properly. But I just want to say that, well, the seems to be is, uh, those of you who have, and I think I'll stop with this slide, Sean. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the idea of a fiber bundle. So the idea of a Basically, you can say the fiber bundle is, is sort of represents the physical degrees of freedom, and then the fiber represents different ways, gauge dependent ways in which you can represent that fundamental thing. So here you could say the, the uh, shape space is the, in the three body problem, it's the shape of a triangle. And then as you go up the fibers, it's all ways in which you can think about the triangle and its size in, in, in absolute space. And then Absolute space, this I first, uh, and he came in. It's in, this, in the fiber bundle, you have got a metric. And that metric defines differences, distances between uh, uh, these fibers here. 
and actually that, what that best matching does is pick up the horizontal distance between two things like that. And that's what's uh, key in the early work that Bertotti and I did. And that's called equivariant best matching or equivariant gauge theory. But you might have the situation, which I think is what is happening, where the geometry is not like that. It doesn't give you parallel things there, but it gives you ones where there's a closest point between there. And what I think is happening in that paper, if it's really right and we can check it, is that you're, you're varying not only the, uh, to go up and down the, the fibre and just pick up the horizontal separation, and it's the same everywhere, you're, you're picking up a horizontal separation, but also where it's shortest. And that's a generalisation of the gauge principle. And if it's right, and it is important that we really check that, do that paper from 2005. Uh, I think that's very interesting and, and that's this relies on going back to the work that I'll end with what the very important work that Neil did as the PhD student of Jimmy York from about 1970 to 1974 which is to solve find a way, a practical, mathematically reliable way to solve the initial value problem in general relativity. So in general relativity, in, in most theories, you just specify initial data and evolve. But there, in gauge theories, you have initial value constraints. In, already in Maxwell's electrodynamics, you have the Gauss constraint. And unless you start with initial data that satisfies the Gauss constraint, you're up the creek. You can't do anything. You've got to have data that satisfy the constraints. In general relativity, the constraints are much more... You, don't, you not only have linear constraints, instead of being a vector constraint, it's a, it's a, tensor con, it's a linear tensor constraint. So you have, you have three constraints uh, uh, in a linear constraint, and then you have a quadratic constraint, which is absolutely notorious. This has been the one that's created immense problems for 60 years in trying to quantize... Uh, general relativity is a quadratic constraint. But how do you even get any data that satisfy that thing? And basically, between 1970 and 74, uh, Neil and Jimmy York, between them, found the method that enables you to get data to do that. And that is precisely on a, uh, a, a, a surface of what's called constant mean curvature surface. It's like, in four dimen it's the four-dimensional analog of soap bulb, uh, soap bubbles in three dimensions uh, and that uh, in a sense one of the things that came out of our interaction with Neil was putting that work on a conceptual foundation where it was clear because York and Neil found it ad hoc but they found they'd got equations which were very good and all of this work in numerical relativity which does with uh, shows how black holes collide and all that stuff and, and, and when they had that movie of the detection of the gravitational waves, what do n-body specialists do? Neil summarized it in the morning. Well, they come into their office in the morning and they use the method, the conformal method, which uh, Neil and Jimmy developed in, in the early 1970s, to get initial data. And once they've got initial data, then they work for about a week to do the evolution from that initial data. But you cannot get anywhere without that initial data. And there's very few sensible ways to go anywhere without that method that Neil and, and Jimmy introduced. And that was why, you may have noticed that quotation from Wheeler and Eisenberg, that they f it was because of the success of that method that back in, in about 1980, Wheeler and Eisenberg said, it may be that general relativity reverses special relativity from within its dynamical structure. So at that point, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, and that leaves us 10 minutes still for discussion. Yeah. Okay, so actually there's uh, plenty of time for questions. Um, and since there is a little kind of questions cut off during the talk, we can ask them. But I just want to anticipate that actually there's a lot of stuff in this talk and a lot of the issues, all the questions anticipated, things that will come up later, so if you feel like everything's coming fast and furious, it, it, there will be uh, talks that hopefully will clarify some of the um, issues that were raised and the questions during the talk. Okay, so who wants to start?
actually I'm not familiar with it till the shade time. Can I ask actually a simple question? In physics, uh, the we don't have actually the scale invariance in it. Physics is what not actually constructing the uh, invariant uh, scale invariant, but in, in putting the shape time, we have to change the, the physics or um, without changing uh, that. I mean, we know actually the that scale change cannot be recognized, uh, but we have to change the physics or. Well, the we have to reinterpret the physics we already have. I don't think, I mean, it, 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 I think it could well, we, we hope it will lead to quantum gravity. But the, the physics, everything that I've said we believe is compatible with known physics. The main thing, the, the one, actually what I didn't say was that the, the, the great difference between the, uh, where's a chalk thing? The great difference, I talked about that, the, the, the difference between the, new te the, the theory which is a geodesic on shape space and, and the Newtonian theory which is not a geodesic. And the great thing about the Newtonian theory, uh, if, it, if you have zero energy and zero angular momentum, is that that root mean square length in a result which Lagrange already found in 1772 is concave. There's a unique point at which for size is, is, is uh, passes through its minimum and it can be zero and on the other side of that you have bi arrows of time which you can define objectively which go in opposite direction consequence of that one extra degree of uh, sorry Dave will be talking about The Janus point there, yes. But so our, we think it's possible we can explain all phenomenon like this. That the law of the universe dictates that there will always be a Janus point. That when you go to the Newtonian extended representation, there is always a minimum size and it grows to infinity in both time directions. And then you get structure formation. Uh, I believe I'm pretty confident to explain why this retarded radiation, uh, whether we could get collapse of the wave function, but I think Tim is working on a model which looks a bit promising for that. Um, and, and I think we certainly get the growth of structure uh, and uh, we, we are able to define a entropy-like quantity for the universe which decreases for the whole universe but then out here you get subsystems form, the subsystems form with low Boltzmann entropy and in the subsystems the entropy grows. So you have two entropy-like quantities but the fundamental one is the one of the whole universe which is decreasing which, which then gives rise to the systems in which conventional entropy grows. How do you define this entropy for the universe? It's uh, just as, as, as um, uh, as um, Boltzmann did, as a, as a count of microstates, you can actually see it in, in, in this, <coughs> this thing here. For spatial things, uh, it, you, can do a sp you can do a spatial entropy, just the spatial part of the entropy, where you just say it's the length. So you can compare. So the really great thing about defining entropy for the whole universe is that uh, when you leave scale in, your phase space or your configuration space is, has infinite volume. It's a non-compact space. Taking out the scale is absolutely critical because shape space is compact. And therefore, you've got a... You've got a it's got a... The probability... Uh, what is the probability that it lies in there? You can take the ratio between those two c uh, contours to the total area of shape space. And you get the typical effect always with, already you see it in the three-body problem, that it's more likely that the Janus point, if you take that probability argument seriously, which Boltzmann did, it's more likely that the system will be at its minimal size somewhere where the complexity is low. And this is Boltzmann's insight that um, 
the uniform states are vastly more uh, there's vastly more of them than the non-uniform states. This is Boltzmann's great insight in 1877. And, and it, just, it just goes through, but in a scale-invariant form uh, here. So Boltzmann had an external unit, but, but we do it without. Uh, and so you can define an entropy-like quantity, but it decreases. You see it here because it starts off here in a region of low complexity. Uh, so here the entropy is, is, is large, and it goes to a region where it's, 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 it's very small, uh, where the entropy is small, but the complexity is high. Do, do you, the, the, the top line there is for an arbitrary number of particles in Newtonian theory, is that right? Yep. The picture is for three particles. Yep. Uh, but uh, Tim and uh, Flavio did numerical calculations with increasing the number of particles. So if you do the three body, uh, sort of the, the picture of how, how it goes, you get sort of how many, uh, what, what's the, you, you get a curve which is typically like, um, oh, why can't this thing write? At, at, which, at which point do you leave Newtonian theory? Because your final shape theory is not Newtonian theory. Oh, no, no, on the contrary. We, we, the, the interesting theory, so there are two theories. There is the pure geodesic theory, which on the first, on the, on the th first appearance you would think is the ultimate in, in the Machian thing. But in fact, actually, the, the Newtonian one is because at this Janus point here, so out here, if you're out Let, let me just finish. Uh, um, but if you go to the Janus point, there is no curving away here because it's tangent to the geodesic. So at this point, a point and a direction determines the solution. Now, as far as the top line is concerned... This thing? Yeah. Gary Gibbons and I did a paper which I think is very interesting. Exact solutions of Newtonian theory which give you exact Robertson-Walker behaviour with completely inhomogeneous distribution of the particles. Um, it depends on the solution of the central configuration equation. And so we've got exactly the opposite of what you've got. We've got completely homogeneous Newtonian models, which are exact solutions of the Robertson-Walker equation, and which have an initial singularity. Yes, but they are. Uh, uh, that, 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 that's if sorry. If you, if you were to, if you were to project <coughs> those on shape space, it would always remain in one. That's just a point in shape space. Remain on one of the critical points of the... Yeah. Because the well, so that, that, that's exactly what... Well, so from the viewpoint of an ordinary cosmologist, the problem is all of the dynamics of ordinary cosmology is at a degenerate point in the uh, Well, that's the point. That's why it's with... That's if I may use a four-letter word and spell it, it's C-R-A-P. It's a lie. Robertson, Friedman Robertson Walker is a downright lie. Where, how would you get perturbed, Friedman-Robertson? You don't perturb. You just start. You, you, you can have a solution which goes through that and it goes out there. It's, it's never homothetic. None of the, the, all of the non-trivial solutions are non-homothetic. Friedman-Robertson-Walker is a fantasy of theoreticians' imaginations who have not shaken off Newtonian intuition. But from the other viewpoint, Friedman wants to walk on an incredibly good first approximation to the real universe. But that's because that's because the what's happening in what's really happening in the change of shape has got averaged into the things. I mean, Friedman Walker Walker starts off by saying it's exactly isotropic and homogeneous, but it just can't be right. There is no matter distribution which is exactly homogeneous and isotropic. That's a that's a that's a fantasy. Yeah, but so forget it. <laughs> forget it. Yeah. Large scale, that's a very good it is on a very large scale, but it may be leading you to a completely distorted picture when you get to the Big Bang. J Julian, I think we yeah. should, uh, yeah, because we don't want to uh, get too. But I mean, yeah. Also, I should say that um, cosmology is not something we've completely come to a picture that we all agree on yet. And Dave will talk about some of the other things that we do know. So, um, uh, but we had a question, a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I just have a very basic. <coughs> question about how you recovered Newtonian mechanics of this picture. So, you have, as I understand it, you have some kind of Lagrangian picture. But what are your parameters that go into Lagrangian? Because I would imagine the natural way to do it would be to have Lagrangian on the shape and the D-shape by T. But you want to recover T as well. So, 
how do you... Um, uh, did, well, actually... Uh, can you just sketch how you get the Newtonian case? I'm going to talk about that. Oh, you said the Yes, okay. T- Tim will talk about that, but actually I did buy a car with winning the first FQXI essay competition on the nature of time, where I explain how that happens if you presuppose scale. But Tim has, uh, Tim has taken this much further. The first thing is you have to... F- you, so you have an autonomous theory which tells you how the shape changes. Then, by, then at some point in the shape curve you say, this is the nominal size of the universe, and you get how the size changes. And then you between two points on the shape curve you say this is one second has passed and then you get time. So you evolve both time, you get both time and shape by quadrature. And this is, Tim has developed this very nicely. The, the, I mean, the, your rule for updating the shape is just a new kind of rule basically. Is it? Yeah, it doesn't look like mm. a standard Lagrangian. Well, the, it, it, well it, 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 you can look like, like pretty like a standard Lagrangian, but it's Jacobi's principle. The, the, the first mathematically rigorous, rigorous formulation of the principle of least action is a timeless one. It's Jacobi's principle. Uh, so it's a t- and, and basically, time is recovered as the, as the parameter which makes the equations of motion take the simplest form, and it's a non-trivial thing because in subsystems, the time you get from isolated subsystems match up, they march in step. They don't have the same frequency, but they, the frequency doesn't change as, as time goes on. So it's all, it's all explained. Yeah. Hmm? I, I Does Tim want to... Uh, no, 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 I think... That Tim will talk about that tomorrow. Uh, yeah, you mentioned there that oh, clearly here the, uh, the shape space here is closed. Uh, to what extent do you expect that to be true of uh, applying this tool to other kind of dynamics? Uh, well, the, the key thing is if you take, if you take the scale out, it, it's not so much closed as compact as the technical, I- technical expression. Now, in, in general relativity, this will work, so I should have emphasized this, this will work if you have a spatially closed universe. So we... we we have shape dynamics will have difficulty if the universe is not spatially closed. Uh, but that that's that's implied. Well, Dave, sorry, Dave will perhaps be able to. I mean, what you're really doing to get compactness is you've got phase space, which is r to the n. Scale is r plus, so you're modding r to the n by r plus, so you get s to the n. So you're going to get compactness in general. And that's. And that's okay with all of the. Well, in field theory, if n goes to infinity, so I think it's not. But yeah, in general, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking your base space is generally r to the n. Okay, so you've got positions and momentum, can't you? Get, you're going to mod out by this idea of scale, and scale is always a positive real number. And so you're modding out by r plus, and obviously, depending on how you do that, you get a cylinder result, but generally, what you end up with is the n square. Yes, perhaps I should. Mm. Yeah, about time. Um, here's something which uh, seems to be in the spirit of your relationism, but I've never heard you discuss it. And I wonder if you'd tell me it's nonsense or somebody else will. I mean, you, you say you don't like the Big Bang 15 billion years ago. Well, it seems irrational to measure time in the past in terms of our years because as you go back in time things get hotter and hotter and processes take place faster and faster so if you would measure time in terms of the some units of to do with clocks that you could construct at the time in the past then a natural measure of time would be logarithmic and logarithm of zero is minus infinity. In other words, you keep going back. More and more things keep happening faster and faster. And so in that sense, there never was a Big Bang. In that, na- in that, natu- in that natural way of, you, in, in that natural way of uh, measuring time relative to the rate at which things then happen. Charlie Wilson essentially proposed this in the 1970s. Okay. And yeah. But does, does, does Tim want to say something? No, Tim does. This is, ex- this is exactly... Well, what you're saying is exactly what we're doing, actually. Um, Julian has not come to the point where, where he talks about uh, what the increment of time is, but if you measure only change of one relational quantity in units of change of another relational quantity, then one of them, one of them plays for 
the time being for a short interval probably only, the role of time of a clock and then you get exactly what you're describing. But, in, but into that has to be go the physics of uh, what's happening at those times. Yes, yeah, the black body radiation nucleus, and it's not just. Yeah, uh, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. You, you need. You need, uh, you need to I mean, this, this also, this is, in a sense, when you come from these simple tall models, you don't see this hierarchy of of different clocks mm. that that are important, but. Um, which is what what Misner was was pointing mm. out. I mean, in, in Misner and Wheeler, there is this uh, oh, there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's a discussion precisely of that, of mm. that point. But but, but but they actually do they they do. I think they fudge it. They 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 they. I think they still assume that there will be clocks. They won't be pulled apart. I mean, my my opinion is clocks just no longer exist. Yeah, things happen. Yeah. Uh, things change, and you. Yes. But 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 there are many ways you can describe that. I mean, in, but Michael, in many ways, I would say it just becomes much simpler at the Janus point because it's just the sh the, the shape. Actually, I mean, this is what Tim is using. He's using uh, the the metric that's defined by the geodesic theory on shape space as the independent variable, and with respect to that, you just pass through the the Big Bang quite smoothly. No, no, that's not what you're saying. But, but, yeah, yeah. So uh, we have time for about one more question. I think Julian left lots of time for discussion. So, mm. anybody else have a question that they want to ask? Okay. Um, just a really quick question on that. So, if you make your clocks basically just the motion of particles, I mean, that's what that's what a clock is. It's just that, that is the ultimate measure of time. Then, how will you recover um, predictions in relativity theory that seem to be about anything that counts as a clock, regardless of its physical constitution. So, I don't think that's the puzzling thing about time dilation and so on, is that it just says what, whatever, whatever physical system we're talking about, if it's a clock, then um, this is the way it's going to behave, right? yeah. as opposed to it being some function of, 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 of how, it, how its dynamics go. Yeah, well, I would say the key thing, you can't define a clock by just having one clock. The key property that means you've got clocks that are sensible is if you have several of them that, well, first of all, if they're all in the same room, they, 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 they march in step. I mean, their frequencies may be different, but the ratios of the frequencies must not be time dependent. That's the criterion. So once you have clocks that satisfy that condition, then you're fine and all of relativity results just follow. We're, we're not doing anything new. But when you go back to the Big Bang, those clocks don't exist. And let me make an observation which is quite striking. You get this fantastic uh, accuracy now with cesium clocks. That accuracy of metrology could, was not possible before the first supernovae had happened because there weren't cesium atoms in the universe to do it. So the fact that we have this phenomenal accuracy now of metrology is because we're in the late universe. And now we're going to the optical. Now we're going to optical clocks, which improve the accuracy by another five orders of magnitude. But it's out here, way, way away from the Janus point. I think that's a good point to end. So uh, why don't we thank Julian? Sure. And, uh, we're gonna, we have coffee in the other room. We reconvene at 11:30.